Metal furniture is superior to wood furniture. Reasons? One, the power of resistance in metal itself. To be of the same solidity, wood would have to be 14 times as thick as metal. Two, because by means of the different methods of manufacture, it opens out new opportunities of design. Three, because it allows of mass production in the factory, lessens the amount of labor required. It is a revolution. Space, light, the joy of creating and of living in this century of ours. Brightness, loyalty, liberty in thinking and acting. We must keep morally and physically fit. Bad luck for those who do not. Well, what about it then? What can we make of Charlotte Perignon's enthusiastic propaganda? Now, all this furniture was designed by Mies van der Rohe and Marcel Breuer in Germany in the 1920s, and it's still in production now. This is Mies van der Rohe's Barcelona chair, and it's nowadays considered a classic. Now, can we really say that Mies selected steel rather than wood because of the strength of the metal? Or Charlotte Perignon's second point, that it allowed for new opportunities of design? Or thirdly, that it allowed of mass production? Certainly, the chair couldn't have been made of wood. But lightness isn't a consideration here. For instance, I could hardly lift it. And as for strength, well, all the strength in this chair comes from the mortised half joint, which we saw being welded up earlier. And ironically, uh, a mortised half joint is closer to wood construction than metal. So does mechanization and mass production really have anything at all to do with this chair? We've seen that it demands endless patient craftsmanship. There's seven hours of hand finishing in the frame alone. And as for the upholstery, it's stitched together out of dozens of pieces of best hide like this, pre-cut to this pincushion shape. And so, of course, it was a very expensive chair, almost as much as a car. The last time I looked in the shops, it was around 450 pounds. Now, this isn't going to be about style or aesthetics at all, but about more everyday problems of furniture design. I'm going to leave special cases like this to look at Britain in the 30s, and in particular at the conflict, real or imagined, between traditional and new techniques of wood furniture production, represented by this selection from heels, and the intrusion of the continental fashion for tubular steel, of which Pell were the chief British exponents. This is the kind of traditional wooden furniture which heels were making in the early part of the century. A chestnut cupboard designed by Ambrose Heel in 1904. Solid timber is mitered together in the cupboard doors, and there's an ingenious latch engineered in wood. Very arts and crafts. There's a drawer, dovetailed along here, and rebated on the face, and the handholds are cut into the solid front in attractive heart motifs. This desk, however, designed by Ambrose Heel in 1930 for himself, was rather different. This is Heel's 1930 catalogue, and you can see that the setting it was intended for was decidedly modern. And in construction, too, it was a very curious mixture. For a start, look at the discreet use of brown oak veneer along the corners, within a framework of a solid carcass construction. And these thick pieces mitered together on the cupboard fronts. The cupboard doors are made of lamin board, veneered to imitate solid oak. On the other hand, the drawers are of quite traditional construction, with these fine dovetails so beloved of the master craftsman. Later on, we'll see how a drawer like this is made by hand. The seat here 
is cantilevered out from massive solid sides in a very architectural way. The chair is constructed of planks and blocks of wood. And the corner desk, designed by Ambrose Heal in 1931, follows a similar pattern. It is very ingenious. Look at how these drawers work. And the little corner cupboard houses a telephone. And this corner cupboard, secret cupboard, is very ingeniously operated. This piece was used as a sort of keynote image in a series of 1930s catalogues. This catalogue, with its provocative title, shows the corner desk among a range of furniture described as the new type furniture, specially designed and made by Heels. In the 1933 catalogue, we see the characteristic stepping of bookshelves and the grouping together of pieces to resemble built-in furniture. There's a cheaper version of our desk in the corner. By 1934, the immediate pinch of the Depression was being lifted, and there are more lavishly veneered pieces of great stylistic simplicity. So, it's clear that by 1930, there was a, a general change of emphasis to provide a visible response to the crisis of the Depression. As wood prices rocketed, and stocks became depleted, new methods of construction were called for. This is a piece of very expensive Rio rosewood being taped up, ready for gluing, in Heels factory. A sheet of particle board, or chipboard, already glued on one face, is laid over the mahogany backing veneer. It's essential to apply veneer to both sides of the board to avoid an uneven pull being exerted by shrinkage or expansion. The glue is cured in a hot press. The press is set for a specific heat, 175 degrees Fahrenheit, and pressure. And then it's left for five minutes. Later, of course, the joining tapes will be removed and the board trimmed, edged and sanded, ready for jointing. You can see that designs most suited to veneers like this would have large areas of smooth, undecorated surface, like this Australian maple writing table designed by Ambrose Heal for the Dorland Hall exhibition in 1933. The effect is obtained by the use of highly figured exotic veneers and detail is kept to a minimum or this sideboard, also designed by Ambrose Heal in the same year. Incidentally, Heal was not averse to designing his own tubular steel furniture using oval section tube. These rather simpler pieces were designed by Christopher Heal for an important exhibition in 1936, Contemporary Furniture by Seven Architects. More and more, manufacturers were tending to the modern system, where smooth sheets of lamin board or chipboard a machine mitered at the edge, fitted with a loose tongue and groove, glued up and jointed like that. So let's look in more detail at the way in which machine processes differed from traditional methods. This man is going to make the dovetails for a drawer.
It's all this marking up, measuring the dovetails precisely so that one piece will match up with its mate, which takes the time in hand dovetailing. Notice how the fine dovetails of the professional require great precision in the saw cuts and a very fine saw blade. Having cut the first piece, he lines up the dovetail saw cuts precisely over the matching piece to transfer them. He will then cut the second dovetail just inside these lines. A really sharp chisel can cut an angled edge like this more precisely than any machine rotary cutter. But great concentration and skill is required. One false move and the wood will split. The hallmarks of a good handmade dovetail are therefore a precise cut and a tight fit and delicately proportioned pins. Machine dovetailing is, of course, much quicker. The dovetails are cut by angled rotary cutters. It's clear where the main saving of time comes with a machine dovetail router. The machine itself takes over the job of lining up and clamping the two pieces in perfect register, as well as cutting both pieces in one action. The rounded pins of the machine dovetail provide rather less gluing surface and are a little weaker. You can see the shape of the pins better here. Notice that in a machine dovetail, the pins are regularly spaced. Now, as we've already seen, Heels wasn't committed entirely to wood. In their furniture catalogue of 1933, for instance, there are several pages of metal furniture, including Mies van der Rohe's MR chair which is still being manufactured today. Now, these pieces, by Pell, were fairly expensive. But Pell never claimed that their furniture was cheap. Comfort, elegance, and strength were their catchwords, although they did market two main lines in cheap stacking chairs, with which most of us are all too familiar, and particularly this one, the RP6. This is the staff canteen in the Peter Jones department store, equipped with RP6s, now, the RP6 was originally designed by an Austrian designer, Bruno Pollock, who patented the stacking principle in 1930. Pell bought it up. At the more costly end of their range, here is the interior of a house at Barnt Green, Birmingham, designed by Stansfield Walker. The austerity and pure forms of the room show well what kind of setting these pieces were intended for. Here's the HT21 dining table, with a set of SP9 chairs. Like the other SP designs, that's spring pattern, these chairs exploited the cantilever principle. There is a weld at the back, here, and here, and here. The seat is screwed onto the frame through tags brazed onto the tube. The whole frame had to be chromed in one piece, which meant a very large chroming tank. The table, on the other hand, is designed in such a way that each of these sections could be chromed separately. These long rods hold the frames together. There are bolts 
which bolt up through these wooden feet. The earliest of these chairs, the SB1, was made by Ackles and Pollock before Pell was even thought of. The frames were sent out to the Birmingham Institute for the Blind, who wove these cane seats. And the designer, George Hackett, who was one of the founder members of Pell, was also a son of one of the Ackles directors. So although some pieces, like this HT5 table, were designed by Pell's first design consultant, Oliver Bernard, it was George Hackett who was really responsible for designing all these pieces. Now, as well as Oliver Bernard, George Hackett also worked with Serge Chemayev. And indeed, this chair, the SP4, is sometimes attributed to Chemayev. It's designed in such a way that the frame can be reused for the SP4B, which is a tub chair where this part is filled in and upholstered. These thin chrome rods support the seat from the backrest, and you can see where they cross underneath the seat. Notice how immaculate this tight leather upholstery is on the backrest and on the seat. Pell had their own upholstery shop using materials like this, a form of woven horsehair and London wool, a form of cotton wool padding. Look at this bend here. You can see that the two pieces have been welded together and smoothed down all the way round. Now, because of the weight of this chair, special high-quality chromolybdenum tube was used, reinforced on this bend where the stress was greatest. You can see how smooth this bend is, with hardly any ridging or necking at all. Now, when you bend the tube like this, you have to be very careful to stop this happening. To keep the walls of the tube apart and prevent the bend flattening, you can use a solid plug of sand or pitch or molten lead, which you empty out afterwards. Nowadays, they use a mandrel, which is held just behind the bending point and which stops the tube collapsing. Now, this chair was originally designed by Marcel Breuer in 1928, and it was later marketed by Pell as the SP64. It consists of two half frames joined together by a single weld at the back. Nowadays, it's manufactured by Hilly International. The steel tubes, which are already semi-bright when they come from the factory, have to go through this machine, a centerless polisher, several times to acquire the right finish. In the 1930s, much of this kind of work would have had to have been done with rotary polishers by hand. As the tubes are polished, they require careful handling, since every mark will have to be taken off by hand. Much of Pell's bending work was done on smaller hand machines than this one, which can be set the precise point along the tube where each bend is to come, and the angle at which the bend will be applied. Even so, the tube has to be taken out and reinserted, since the bench is not long enough to allow all the bends to be done in one sequence. After taking the tube out, the machine has to be re-zeroed with the special rest. Notice that the complexities of this machine's action result from the need to rotate the tube precisely before each bend at a new angle. On the Hillmore and Kennedy hand benders used by Pell throughout the 1930s for most purposes, the judging of these angles had to be done by eye. Once the bends have been put in, the half frame has to be checked in a checking jig. The completed half frames are jigged up for butt welding. 
This modern machine is an electric flash butt welder. Pell would have used more conventional welding equipment in the 1930s. We'll see this weld being dressed later. The way they braze the end caps nowadays is to insert plugs into the ends of the arm tubes and then braze around the beveled edge. In the cheaper lines, like the stacking chairs, simpler push-fit end plugs were used. This too is going to have to be dressed off later. Here's one operation which will hardly have changed at all since the 1930s. At each stage of the bending and welding of the half and whole frames, someone has to check them and correct any misalignments. Pell used a kind of spirit level with a protractor for testing the non-vertical angles. Now, here's the brazed end cap ready for dressing. Just as in the Barcelona chair, this simpler piece requires a great deal of hand finishing. You can see the butt joint disappearing under the rotary disc. Each bend in the frame will have been marked by the bending die, leaving a ridge, it's known as necking. When the frames go for chroming, they have to be flawless because the chrome accentuates every defect. So, it wasn't just Mies van der Rohe's designs which depended on the skills of highly trained craftsmen. In Charlotte Perrion's enthusiasm for the art of the machine, the aesthetic of gleaming metal, she ignored the complex realities of industrial production. And wood processes, too, were changing in a fundamental way to meet the new conditions. Despite the economic rigors of the 1930s, high-quality finish and good craftsmanship were as much in demand as ever. <laughs>